like a lot of horse people, I said, but I don't know about horses. This seems, you know, because I was very entrenched in the horse world at that time. So, um, but I started trying it because I'm, I'm very nosy and also lucky in that I had people that let me do whatever I wanted with their horses. So when I started loving it and I started doing it more and more and more and more, here we are. Um, so I sort of came to it that way and um, then I went to vet school and um, learned about veterinary behavior, got to follow a veterinary behaviorist and so now I'm trying to mash it all together into one business. So tell your friends. <laughs> um, so my main goal with my lecture is to go over the ways that behavior changes. Um, we've talked a lot about, about positive reinforcement, but for me it's been helpful to have a sense of like all the ways that behavior can change. If I'm troubleshooting or I don't understand why a behavior changed, sometimes I can go back to my book and be like, okay, maybe this is what's going on and that helps me come at it from another approach. Um, the other thing I usually put in here is like, why do we even care about behavior? Which you guys obviously already do, so that's great. I don't have to jam on that. When I'm talking to like vets and vet techs, um, sometimes something that's a little convincing is that veterinary behavior, uh, veterinarians in general have one of the most dangerous jobs, injury-wise, for injuries that take you out of work in, at all that exist. So in the UK, there was a study that showed that, that of civilian occupations, you find veterinarian was the highest on the list for injuries. And we all know why, because horses are, are prey animals and they're scared of a lot of things that veterinarians do. So um, for me, a happy horse is a safe horse, is a comfortable horse, and so that's you know that's a no-brainer for me. So sometimes people can be convinced by that too. So um, I will just start. Sean actually did a lot of this yesterday, so that's good. I can skim right through it to the demo. Um, but I usually start with the seven the ways that we do the Projector is Shauna, so if I start to <laughs> if I start to trail off, please just give me like a one of these or something. Um, okay, so I won't make you guys do audience participation, but you know what the first four are going to be probably, right? Positive reinforcement. We'll just do our time. Time. Negative reinforcement. Does anybody have any thoughts? I said I wasn't going to, but I lied. Um, what, what other ways to ch that behavior changes at all over time? I say this word like 10 times a day to you probably, Samantha. <laughs> uh, habituation. <laughs> habituation, yes. And what about situation? <laughs> situational, very good. Situation. I'm going to call that one environmental change. One that's linked to habituation, but is the opposite. So you know what that's called? Sensitization, is that what you said? Great. Okay. So environmental change is something we really like to forget about, or at least you do when I did when I was starting it out. It was like, how can I train it? How can I train it? My dog's getting into the trash can. I'll train him to stop. And really the easiest thing was to put the trash can underneath the sink. And we forget about that. That's the really obvious environmental change that you can sometimes do. Um, another thing that I think about within the changing the environment is actually I'm using the word environment a little bit loosely because an environment is a whole emotional, social, and physical context. So sometimes changing the environment is about you know the horses, the horses buddy left yesterday, and the horse has been beside themselves since then. Maybe that's not the day to do the training or whatever. So that letting the horse settle in can make a different emotional context for what you're doing, and that can also change the behavior and their response to the training. Um, so those are the seven that I was taught. Argue later about it anymore. <laughs> okay. Um, and I'm going to talk first 
to actually, we of course want to get to the top four because that's the more interesting. But I think habituation and sensitization also deserve their time and are super interesting. I'm just going to put this on the floor. So I'm going to talk about those just a little bit. Um, those are both types of non And they're not associated because there's no association with an outcome. And that's confusing when you first learn about it because, especially when you're in behavior, you're like, there's an outcome, obviously. But the learning all happens without the stimulus. So in non assertive learning, there's a stimulus of any kind. So similar to environment, stimulus can be anything. It can be something like a needle poke, or it can be something like you know, loud noise. That's sort of what you think of as a stimulus. Or it can be you know, an emotional stimulus, or the wash doll, or, I mean, it could be anything, so this is a little bit of a loose term. And then you have a response. And after that, technically, for non associative learning, it doesn't really matter. You just have a stimulus and a response. I know this is really abstract, but um, it's just repeated presentations of the stimulus. So even if there is no outcome, let's say a ladder falls in your barn and it makes a loud noise, and more startles, that would be considered their response. The next time the stimulus comes around, the ladder falls again. Does the horse react more? Are they sensitized to that sound, or do they react less? Do they habituate to the sound of the ladder falling, or it's just a ladder? I don't really care. Um, so there's in, in uh, horses, usually we want them to habituate, and, and they, because they're, been, they're raised with humans for a long time, they, they are very good at this, and sometimes they habituate to things that, you know, traditional trainers don't want them to, and that's sort of how it ends up, you know, you're, first you're just squeezing and everything's nice, and then you're, you're kicking, and they're, they've habituated to that, and then sometimes you see a little kid on a pony, and they're just... The legs are going, and the whip is going, and the pony's just standing there, right? That's all. That's all from habituation happening. Um, so, obviously, we want to habituate the things that we want them to relax to, and we want them to respond to our treats and be happy about those. So, this is this is how non-associative learning works, and um, and get a horse to habituate, oversensitize. There's three I's that we can use as guidelines, the letter I, um, to push a horse towards habituation, oversensitization. So the first one is the interval between the same lines. So if the ladder falls and then it falls again five minutes later versus if it falls again the next day, you'll have a different amount of habituation or sensitization based on that interval. Um, the other thing is the intensity of the signals. So I think about this when I think about people who are like showing their horses a tarp or showing them a weird object. The intensity of the stimulus, you usually start small and then you build up because that will push your horse towards habituation. They can habituate to a smaller stimulus, a smaller intensity than a larger intensity. And, um, you know, there's people that think that the fastest way to habituate a horse to a tarp is to tie it to their tail and let them loose. And what those people may find is that they think they're causing habituation, but if the horse is given a choice, they're not going anywhere near it. They've actually sensitized. Because it's the exact same protocol, but a different intensity, they're sensitized to the tarp. They don't want to be anywhere near the tarp. They don't even want to see the ring. They might be sensitized to you touching their tail. I mean, you know, sensitization generalizes a lot. So that's the, you know, keeping the intensity low can be helpful for you to habituate. The last one is um, emotional. But I didn't actually spell it correctly, you'll notice, but it, I think it works better if they're all three eyes. <laughs> so if a horse is relaxed and you're doing training with them or you're doing habituation with them, they're much more likely to habituate than if they're coming in alert like something bad is going to happen. And that can vary a lot based on the horse's emotional state and their personality and what's going on that day. You know, I can go to a barn and vaccinate 
60 yearlings, and you know, you come back two weeks later to their boosters, and some of them have habituated, they're like, oh, needle poke, okay, and some of them have sensitized. And that's probably based on, you know, their personality and the environment. Probably if there's like a mower coming around scaring the crap out of all those horses when I'm trying to vaccinate them, the next time it's going to be a lot harder because they all will sensitize to those. Um, so sorry, I went back for that, but let's go to associative because that's what everybody really wants to hear about. There's a stimulus, there's a response, and then there's an outcome. Sorry, my handwriting is really, really bad, so just bear with me. Um, the learning in associative, in associative learning happens all in here. It's about what their response is. That's what they learn about. And it's not associative learning, they're learning something about the stimulus. And um, I'm breezing through this, but I think it's really cool, and there's a lot of cool studies. So um, if you guys want to know about more lectures that I do, I will go into more detail. Okay. This is where I usually draw the square, which is maybe helpful because um, it is really confusing. And I know we talked about this yesterday, but it can be helpful to see it on paper. So you can really write it any, any, any old way, but I usually put positive here, negative there. We're talking about an increase in the frequency of behavior. We're talking about decreasing the frequency of behavior. So does everyone, was everyone here yesterday and sort of knows what I'm talking about? So this is, this is the operant conditioning well, the square that um, is that was yeah. referring to. So you can kind of like fill in each quadrant. Oh, sorry. You can fill in each quadrant based on what, based on what is on the edges. So in this quadrant, I'm going to put positive reinforcement. Because I have a plus here for positive. And I have reinforcement because I'm increasing the frequency of the behavior. Okay. So, and remember, Something really important to not get yourself confused about is that the positive and negative has nothing to do with the value um, that, that the force has. Positive and negative is just we're adding something and we're subtracting something. So if it helps you think of like pressure release for negative reinforcement, think about it that way. Um, it's really hard to get that out of your head and people get negative reinforcement and positive punishment confused really often, but they're actually you know, on opposite ends of the of this square for what your what the protocol is going to be. Um, so in positive reinforcement, we're adding something to the horse to increase the frequency of behavior. Usually what we're adding is something like a treat or a scratch or whatever. You guys are already sold on positive reinforcement. It's really great. I don't have to spend a lot of time talking about it. Um, the only point I was going to make about positive reinforcement is that it's, it's hard, I think, is something that people don't always think about. Um, you guys all know because you've tried it yourself, you know that it's hard and your timing has to be good. I think in the horse world there's a little bit of a stigma that like, oh, any person could do that. It's nothing like the highfalutin, intense training that I've worked on for myself. You know, it doesn't take that kind of skill. But of course it does. You know, it, it's like when you first start it, it's like learning a whole new, it's like starting to ride again. So you have to give yourself time and give yourself patience about it. And also just recognize that um, it's really a powerful, powerful tool. So learning how to do it correctly is, is super important and will avoid people being like, oh, I tried it, it doesn't, it doesn't work. You know, that's just absolutely not true. So I think really that, that's, the, that's the main point of positive reinforcement for me. Um, so who goes in here? Negative. Negative, right? So we're sort of getting up the squares. And what's next? We're increasing the frequency of the behavior. Reinforcement. So it's got to be reinforcing. That's right. And this is what Shauna was talking about. Like you might put some pressure on the lead rope. The horse steps forward. That automatically puts slack in the lead rope, right? So that pressure goes away. So negative reinforcement is also something that horses are really, really good at because of our, their long history and selection over, you know, I don't know, a thousand years, 
of people only doing this sort of training at all. So if you try to go to a zebra and try this and see what you think, I mean, I think horses are attuned to this. And something you have to think about with that is that you can do it accidentally. Um, so in my job, I have to go to a lot of barns where people don't, aren't interested in positive reinforcement. They just want their horse ultrasounded or whatever I've been sent there for. Maybe the horse has never been clipped before. So I'm in sort of a training challenge situation. Maybe I've even asked them, do you mind if I give your horse treats? And they're like, no. So you kind of have to, like Shana said, go down the list of what you can use to help that horse understand that they're going to be okay. Um, and what I, the, the, the loop I see some veterinarians get into is they'll be like clipping a leg or even suturing a leg and the horse, you know, the clippers are on, they're buzzing, and the horse picks up their leg and whoop, the clippers came off. And then the leg goes down, and then the clippers go back on. So maybe even a little bit of positive punishment going on there for them putting the leg down. And then whoop, the leg goes up and the clippers have to come off because the horse moved their leg. And so um, then you get really frustrated vets going like, this horse won't put their leg down, but you've actually trained them to pick their leg up. <laughs> so, you know, just, it's something to keep in mind to just, like what I do, is to just keep the threshold low, just keep the criteria low, so you don't get into that situation at all. When I'm flipping a leg, I might, you know, if I'm at that barn where I can't use treats or whatever, I might just flip for half a second and take the flippers off, so that the horse knows it's going to go away if the leg's down. Sometimes I pick the leg up and it goes away, but it's going to go away anyway, so I don't have to worry that it's not going to go away. Um, so that's, that's something that comes up a lot in my, that I see a lot happen and also that comes up a lot in what I do with horses. Um, a lot of horses I worked with in the hospital can't have treats, either they're colicking or they're sedated, or again, the owners say no. Whatever the case may be, um, negative reinforcement can be your best friend or your worst enemy, so it's something to keep in mind. Okay, so what do we get down to here? We're talking about positive. Negative. Positive. Oh yeah, right. Positive. And what are we? We're decreasing the frequency of behavior, so it's okay. How about how about over here? fear emotion and they're stepping forward and you punish them 
you know, that emotion's still there. So even if you can successfully punish the step forward, they might go back or they might go up or they might go sideways. They're still doing something because standing still is really hard for them. So I don't need to tell you guys not to use this. Um, we try as hard as we can to not. Sometimes, you know, if what punishment can do is stop the behavior that's happening in, in that moment. So you're walking the pony and you have a little girl, cute pigtails, oh, it's so cute. And a motorcycle rolls by and the pony goes up in the air. You know, you might grab onto that pony to try to stop them in that moment. But what the research has showed and what we all know is that if that motorcycle rolls by again, that pony is equally likely to do the same thing. It doesn't, you're not really changing the behavior. Um, I think that's all I have for this page. Maybe all I have for the talk. So if anybody has any questions, I'll take them. Otherwise, I'll do our little demo. Yes, go ahead, Erin. Do you see a lot of um, behavioral fallout from these deposit punishment horses? Yes, I mean, horses are amazingly forgiving. It's really a shock to me every day what people do get away with, um, and horses still perform. I mean, people jump the jump, and the rider falls back, and the horses get popped in the mouth, and they slam on their back, and the horse keeps jumping. And you're like, if I was a horse, I would not do that. <laughs> but, you know, horses are wonderful animals, so, um, Sometimes you don't, but there's horses that won't tolerate it. Like, you know, like uh, Shauna's horse won't tolerate it. He obviously had an extreme, Shauna's horse, sorry. Samantha's horse. Oh. He, he was an extreme case, but, you know, horses will only go so, be pushed so far. <laughs> Did you have a question? Is this required learning in your medical protocol in school? No. I don't know. No, I learned this in college, and, and then after college, I was trying to write a question, so I, you know, I solidified some that school and I had to kind of seek out behavior control, which is why a lot of um, equine veterinarians don't understand this. And when I give this talk to veterinarians and vet techs, it's kind of like, okay, you know, they don't really, they don't, they don't value all. it at all. They don't really get it, actually, almost always. And you think they would because, you know, nobody really wants to be kicked and bitten and stepped on, but what are you going to do? Any more questions?
God forbid, three times a day. You know, um, it's sort of different because you have to get the med in at some point. Um, you can't have cookies. That is the absolute worst thing for you. That was a bad decision on my part. We're sneaking, we're sneaking over here. Um, so, gosh. I guess the, probably the easiest one to show you guys would be the oral meds. Um, and so when I, when I can, I guess I'll show you, so I'll tell you about what I, if I, if I had this horse in the hospital, let's say, um, ideally, it has been, um, I would, um, I would hopefully be able to find some time to fill a syringe with applesauce, which I didn't do today, which was silly. So I can do some positive and some negative reinforcement. Sorry? You have applesauce? Because we could put some in my syringe. But we also, we don't have to actually give them anything today I, to make the point, to get the point across. Um, so what I will do is sort of a combo of negative and positive reinforcement. So basically what I'm trying to do is to relax his head down and sort of say, okay, easy. You know, why does he And what a lot of people do is they'll like hide the syringe, right? But I actually want to know what I'm, what we're about to do so that he can consent to it so he can say, okay, oh, fine, just do it. So usually when you're giving oral meds, what you do, you stand on the left side, and you have your and you're going to go as fast as you can so the horse doesn't have a chance to say no. So, okay. So I'm going to wait for him to do the end thing that's like relaxation, and then I'm going to treat him. Just like, just like always, you guys do that. And with some horses, I can't even get to this this point. I have to just have a syringe in my hand, and then put the syringe away and treat it. And basically, removal of the syringe. Sometimes horses won't even take the treats. Removal of the syringe will be a very strong reinforcer for a fear of the horse. So sometimes I have to just put it on their shoulder. Good boy. Your pony pops a fever, and you're like, Well, I really should have done the syringe training before now, but I don't 
a time like the present, and you just keep going. Um, so with him, it seems like his avoidance behavior isn't the head going up, it's him water skiing, whoever's touching him that way. So I'm, instead of taking his head coming down, I'm going to just take him coming back towards me.
not using negative punishment. And I guess I've always considered, maybe I'm wrong in this, but I've always considered like an open bar, closed bar, or doing something like holding the halter, feeding, 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 and then the food and the hold go away at the same time to be, is that negative punishment? Am so I, you know what I'm saying? So what would be the behavior that's so causing the, you to let go? So your increase, well, oh, that's right. So the behavior is is not decreasing. I guess the only behavior that's decreasing is the balking. Yeah, so or is the still increasing? Yeah. 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 I guess my, sorry, my question wasn't very clear, but everyone knows kind of what I'm saying. I, I think I know. Yeah. I think what I mean, I guess when I say it's not used that much, maybe when we treat a lot and then we don't treat in the absence of yeah, like that, withholding. Yeah, that could be considered a negative punishment. because it's like causing was frustration. They're all kind of yeah, right, right, right. Of even if it's unintentional. Together. Yeah, yeah. But mostly, like when we're most people don't establish like you get a treat for this thing, so it never there's never the chance for the horse to realize oh I did this other behavior and then I expected a treat and I didn't get one. Okay, it just doesn't happen except for in our context. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, um, so what, what would you label it then if I'm doing something like I'm holding the cheek piece of the halter, I'm feeding, I'm feeding, I'm feeding, and then I take both my feeding hand and my, my holding hand away, and then I go back, I hold the halter, feed, 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 and then both go away to teach the horse that it's okay to be held. Like being held and being fed happen at the same time, yeah. and they both go away at the same time. They happen at the same time, they go away at the same time. The whole. the whole okay and changing its like emotional or CER. value yeah exactly okay. the CER thing like okay. I'm just I'm just working on the emotional or environment yeah what I call yeah the environmental, okay. making an environmental change okay is that a good enough answer yeah I think it's right <laughs> and I think it depends on how the horse feels about it yeah. Yeah. if the horse is like I don't really care I think it's more classic conditioning in a way. Okay. You know what I mean? But yeah. if the horse does care, yeah. then it's going to go to counter conditioning, yeah. systematic desensitization. Okay. Because so I was thinking of even, like, like for the horse that you met yesterday, like I did a lot of that with holding the halter, but maybe I should start doing that with like things like a needle pinch or things like the, just all the things that he thinks are aversive. Yeah, you and if he finds it's aversive, then it's a, they both go it, away. A, then it's counter conditioning, exactly. Okay. Like yeah. Okay. And, and really, I think this is really important. We are the parents. And there's times, like when Bugsy had to have five tubes of meds, and a lot of them being dissolved pills, every day for six weeks. And I was like, I'm going to climb on your head and give you this no matter what. You know what I mean? That you're getting these because this is for your life. Yeah. And, and there's times where I'm, I'm like, I'm going to go there. He let me do it all for six weeks without a halter. But I didn't 